Um, hi, my name is Andrew Glazier. Uh, this is my co-panelist. Dave Moss. Dave Moss. And we're here today. We're going to tell you a little bit about California privacy laws. Um, I'm going to be talking about all the wonderful ways that California has in the past helped privacy and may in the future help privacy, whereas David is going to talk about all of the ways that California wants to take your privacy away from you. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I could talk about what we're doing at the legislature now, and there are some good things going on. So, okay, okay. You know. It's just California tends not tends to be very protective of your privacy unless they're the ones trying to take your privacy away. <laughs> Anyways, um, how many of you, uh, so I am an attorney licensed in Florida and Georgia, and everything I say here is my own personal views and interpretation of the law. It does not reflect the views of any of my clients, and I'm not here on any of their behalves. But I have helped, uh, my work for a law firm, Glazier & Glazier, we help innovative small businesses get started and hopefully make a lot of money. We also help technology clients protect their work and be able to comply with a myriad of laws. Um, David, what do you do? Yeah, so I'm an investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which often uh, involves keeping police accountable by filing lots of public records requests and calling them up on the phone and trying to get information from them. Uh, this year, uh, ever since November, uh, you know, which you know, things happened in November, uh, the California legislature uh, won a supermajority, and uh, the Democrats won a supermajority in the California legislature, which gives them a quite a bit of power, and everyone wants to make their mark against the Trump administration, which means, um, while well, previous years we've had a very hard slog to get things done, suddenly we have new momentum um, that we didn't have before. And so it's been a pretty good year, and it's uh, taken a lot of my, my uh, 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 cycles to get uh, that I would normally put toward investigating to going and lobbying the legislature and trying to explain technology to them, trying to explain why people's privacy is important. Um, and we've done pretty well. Uh, one of our bills died yesterday, which we'll talk about, uh, which is very, very sad. But we still got, I think, eight more that uh, still have a chance. All right. So. Obviously, as you all know, California is very, very large, both in terms of area and population. And so things tend to happen in California that can have a major impact on the rest of the country, whether it's just laws being implemented in California that the rest of the country looks at and says, yeah, that's a great idea, or mm, like a certain property tax referendum that passed about oh, 30, 40 years ago now. Uh, or whether it's something like something to help protect your privacy, a do not call registry. California was one of the first states to implement a do not call list for telemarketing purposes. And you sign up and say, stop calling me. And uh, obviously that has now become a national thing, but it started with states like California pushing that to help people be less annoyed at dinner time. <clears throat> one of the biggest things with California is, as I mentioned, I work with technology clients. And with the internet, everybody has a website. What a lot of people don't know is that a lot of some states have regulations that affect what you have to put on your website. The biggest, the most interesting thing with California is that it doesn't have to be you don't have to be in California to be subject to California laws, then, which is why Florida Georgia Lawyer, I have to know about laws in California. You uh, just have to basically transact business with California residents, which in this day and age means if you have a website and you're trying to go nationwide, you're probably doing business with people in California, which brings you under their jurisdiction. Technically, this brings you under every other state's jurisdiction as well, but most states do not have these sorts of privacy laws and where they do, California's are still ahead of the game. And it helps if I have the right page of notes up. So, one of the biggest things is that California has what they call uh, the California Online Privacy Protection Act. This is above and beyond what other entities like the Federal Trade Commission require you to do when you're interacting with people online. There is, the only federal law on this is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which is, makes for wonderful acronyms when you're trying to talk about both of them at the same time. Uh, internally, we usually refer to the California one as cal -APA, whereas the other one is CAPA. <clears throat> but this is a law that requires you to have a conspicuously posted privacy policy on any website on which you're collecting personally identifiable information which can include not just things like name and address, but things like IP addresses and anything else that could be linked back to you specifically. 
If you have an email contact form on your website, you better have a privacy policy. If you're interacting with Google Maps, you may need a privacy policy. And it makes for some riveting reading. It's <laughs> so wonderfully reading these things. But a lot of websites, even nowadays, you see privacy policies, but Sometimes people will say, oh, I see, I need a privacy policy, and they just go and take one from another website and don't look at it and don't even change the email addresses that are on it. That's not going to work very well. Uh, it needs, your privacy policy needs to have a list of all personally identifiable information that they collect. If you're collecting names, you have to say, we collect names. If you're collecting birth dates, you say that as well. It has to have a list of categories of third parties, advertisers, with whom the operator may share that information. So if they're going to, if you have a plug-in from Google, you have to say, we are sharing your information with someone like Google. Uh, it has to have a description of the process. If any, this is, a, this is the big if, you don't actually have to have a process, but if you have a process by which the consumer can remove their personally identifiable information, you have to detail it. Because it doesn't do you much good to say, oh yes, we have a process to do that, and then never tell the consumer what that process is. That's usually considered fraud. Uh, the big, next big thing, does anybody here know what a do not track signal is from a browser? Okay. Uh, modern browsers have a function called do not track, where if a website is configured correctly, they will, the browser will send a specific signal saying, hey, we're not going to collect any cookies or any personally identifiable information from your machine. This often doesn't get implemented because it's a little difficult to implement. California says you have to tell someone whether or not they're collecting do not track. And here's the wrinkle, and this is where this law gets a little screwy. You have to be able to tell them whether third parties obey do not track signals. Well, how are you going to get Facebook with the Facebook plugin to tell you whether or not they're obeying do not track signals? Or even better, a WordPress plugin. So that's, that can be a bit, of a, a bit of a tricky. Sometimes when we're dealing with this on the legal side, it's a little better to err on the side of, yeah, we don't obey do not track signals and our third parties will just say they don't because we really can't be sure that they do. This is one of those areas where California goes real close, really, really almost there, and then drafts something kind of strange that makes everybody scratch their heads and go, how in the world can we ever possibly comply with this? Uh, the CALOPA itself does not contain enforcement provisions, so it doesn't give anybody a private right of action, but it is enforced through California's unfair competition law. Uh, city and county attorneys can file suit against businesses for that, so if you uh, get, the upshot of that is, if you get big enough, the California Attorney General can and will drag you into court. And this law applies, interestingly, not just to websites, but to apps, and about four or five years ago now, Kamala Harris, who you may have heard about, is a new senator from California. When she was the Attorney General, she started going after a number of apps for um, not having a privacy policy. So when you open an app and it says, hey, if you want to use this app here, click here to see our privacy policy. A lot of those came about because Kamala Harris in California went after a number of companies to say, hey, you've got to actually comply with this law. And yes, that includes apps. Uh, the only one who, uh, pretty much everybody was like, ah, Kidoki, we'll just send her a consent decree and everything will be fine. She did go to court against one uh, who is very familiar to many people in this room, Delta. Uh, Delta was saved only by the fact that the Airline Deregulation Act says that states can't actually enforce things against airlines. So the airlines don't have to comply with this, but everybody else does. Uh, another big thing is a California law that doesn't even apply to online businesses specifically. This is a law that um, under California general business conduct, if you collect information from a California resident and sell it for direct marketing purposes, you have to maintain a list of who it was sold to. And the company has to provide a list to any customer that asks for it. This was really intended to stop a lot of things like Publishers Clearinghouse, where they would go and collect all your information and then give it to 10,000 different advertisers of bulk mail. And you're trying to figure out how in the world did you get my address? Did you like look through the phone book or what? <laughs> 
But what it has done now, it started to be applied again to online advertisers. Everybody knows big data is really big, and a lot of websites will take your information and sell it to third parties because that's worth a lot of money to them. They can data mine it, they can send you advertising, they can target things specifically. So California law says if you collect that data from any California resident, a California resident can come and say, hey, I want that list. And since there's a lot of California residents, once they have the list, they can send the list to everybody. So if you're wondering why you get ads from Breitbart when you're looking at Facebook, this is why. The other, uh, the other big thing that's been moving through California recently um, is everybody here is, who here was here last night for the net neutrality talk? You were. Okay, good. Well, I know you were. Uh, I'm going to bore you for a bit because I'm going to give a brief summary of net neutrality. Who here is familiar with what net neutrality is? Who here is familiar with net neutrality beyond having just heard of it? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, net neutrality is essentially, um, as was discussed last night, it's kind of misnamed. It's really less about being neutral and more about preserving the freedom of the open internet. What it is designed to do is ensure that internet service providers cannot um, arbitrarily block content from certain websites. Let's say, you're, let's say you're Comcast and you own Hulu and you have this little upstart thing called Netflix you may have heard of. Well, they might decide they don't want traffic going to Netflix, so without net neutrality, they could just say, hey, everybody in Comcast, you're in our walled garden, no more Netflix for you. You can't throttle connections, which means you can't uh, dial Netflix's speeds down so much that it becomes useless. Um, the Verizon was allegedly doing this to Netflix for a couple of months, and um, you could see it in the data. Every night, about 7 o'clock Eastern, Netflix traffic over, com over Verizon would suddenly get throttled to the point where you couldn't load anything, slower than dial-up speed. Uh, you can't uh, charge people, you can't charge content providers for preferential access. This is called paid prioritization. You can't go to uh, somebody, and I'll stop picking on uh, Comcast here, uh, AT&T can't say, hey, all traffic coming from T-Mobile, if you actually want that to get to our devices, you have to pay us more money or we're just going to, we're going to come let it through at one gigabyte per second, whereas everybody else is coming through at 20. Uh, megabyte, not gigabyte, I knew that. <clears throat> That's some fast internet. That, is, that would be extremely fast. fast. Yeah, Comcast gigabit internet, uh, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> the other thing with net neutrality is that you have to be transparent about what you're doing. And this involves not just the practices uh, that you have internally. This is not just what you're doing, paid prioritization or bro blocking or throttling if you are allowed to do any of those, um, but you actually have to tell your customers what you're doing, what they're doing with your data, and also how the service actually works, because you don't want to have a situation where uh, Sprint says, oh yes, we have unlimited data, asterisk, in very small print. You get, five gig, you get five gigs of data, and then it's going to cost you five bucks per gig after that. Have fun with that. And that's usually considered, oh, oh, and that fine text is in a URL that was in the footer on the asterisk, which is contained behind another URL on another page in a PDF that's only accessible in Outer Mongolia. You are, um, you can't do that anymore. That would be considered deceptive, and you cannot hide the ball with your terms of service. You can do, now the trick is, you can still do almost anything you like, other than this no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, but you have to tell the customer what they're doing. So, the FCC, after many years, of uh, uh, the, the internet sort of worked like this unofficially. The net neutrality principles were there, everyone was playing nice with each other, really until Netflix came along, and Netflix suddenly started accounting, what is it, 40%, 60% of internet traffic in about a year? Um, so the ISPs decided, well, we want Netflix to pay more money for this, and uh, Verizon actually went to court to challenge some rules that the FCC had put in place at the time, these net neutrality principles, and they won, because at the time, the FCC was trying to regulate them under this so-called Title I light touch regulation, uh, the court said, you don't have the authority to do that. But if you went and reclassified them as Title II, so they're telecommunications providers like the traditional Ma Bell landline services, that would probably work. Guess what the FCC went and did? Yeah, they reclassified it. Uh, so all the other ISPs were saying, Verizon, stop, what are you doing? This is insane, you're going to get us all in trouble here. And it, they were right. 
So the providers got reclassified as Title II. They have to comply with net neutrality, plus a host of other regulations that you bring in with Title II. What the government has done is forborn, I hate that word, from applying certain regulations of Title II to broadband internet providers. And I won't go into the details here, but when the ISPs claim that they're applying a 1934 regulation to the modern internet, they've, FCC has already actually taken most of that 1934 regulation out and just said, eh, doesn't apply to you. What they have kept are the protections on things like privacy and access. So, then we had a little presidential election and a new FCC chairman and suddenly all the priorities changed and the FCC is now going backwards and saying, uh, we don't actually like what we just did last year and we're going to toss it all out the window. This has made a lot of people very unhappy, to say the least. So California, a, an enterprising little representative, what is his name? His name is Assemblymember Ed Chow. Thank you, and I, I don't know why I said little, that was rude. Um, I, you want me to talk about that? Uh, no, talk no, no, no. I was gonna, just going to go say, um, I mean, I can, you can come in here, but uh, he is essentially pushing very hard to get the net neutrality rules enacted in California. And uh, it, it's actually the, uh, the broadband privacy rules. Oh, just the privacy rules? Yeah, the, the, the net neutrality stuff is not up yet. All right, David? Sweet. All right, I'll talk about that. Do you, do you have more to your presentation? We can jump back to you. Okay. So, yeah, as part of the, the net neutrality, uh, you know, around that same time, the FCC passed so pretty sweeping <laughs> privacy protections for uh, your broadband pri uh, broadband consumers. Uh, essentially saying, I'm not going to go into the, the, you know, the weeds here, but that ISPs have to get your permission before they collect your data, before they sell your data, and you know, before they do all sorts of you know, you know, crummy things with your personal information. Um, Congress went and repealed that. It wasn't the FCC. Congress decided, no, 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 we don't want this regulation anymore. Even though no one in the world other than your Comcast and your Verizons and your Coxes actually, you know, everybody else wanted it except for them. And there was huge outcry. Nevertheless, Congress went and repealed it. Immediately after, Assemblymember Ed Chow, um, who chairs the Assembly uh, Privacy Committee, you know, we're very lucky in California that we have an actual legislative committee that looks at privacy issues, uh, reintroduced uh, introduced legislation through a process called Gut and Amend. In other states, it might call be called like Strike All, or it might be called something else. But basically, you take a piece of legislation that you already had that's too, it's too late in the process to introduce something new, so you cut everything from your previous bill and just insert new language, and that gets you, you know, like five steps ahead of the process. And so we went and did that, and it's been a very, very hard negotiation process for the last couple of months. Um, we're up against uh, Big Telecom, which is one of the biggest lobbying um, industries around. They spread money around like it was, I don't know, what else do you, what do you spread around? Uh, um, scatological things that we will not say on this kind of broadcast. <laughs> they, they, they spread around a lot of money, let's say that. And, they, uh, and that allows them to have a certain amount of influence and it's, you know, they are not above uh, misrepresenting the law, they're not above misrepresenting the impact, they're not above misrepresenting how it will impact them and their profits and their ability to give service. Um, and so yeah, the misrepresentations, I just want to jump in, uh, they say with a straight face, oh, we were totally playing by the net neutrality rules before we uh, were had them forced on us. Uh-huh. No. no. Um, and so they're very, very against this, and so we're in a, a real head-to-head -head fight over uh, getting uh, this bill, which is AB 375, passed. Um, and if it does pass, it would restore the, the rules to, you know, as much as the state can restore the rules that the FCC had, uh, had, uh, had passed. And as far as how that might impact uh, the entire country, like, you know, like Andrew said, uh, you know, if it passes, it sets the model, and maybe other states pass something similar. But also, it means that every, you know, uh, telecommunications provider is going to decide whether they want to play, you know, set up a whole, you know, uh, a siloed set of rules for California and have different rules for everywhere else, or if they're going to say California is so big and, you know, building the infrastructure for California means we should do that elsewhere. Um, you know, which maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, the status on the bill is uh, a little precarious right now. I can't actually tell you where the bill is because all we know is that it has to pass out of the legislature by September 15th. And then the governor has to act on it or not act on it by October 15th if it lands on its desk. If he doesn't act on it, it becomes law. He, but he can also veto it. He can also sign it. 
Uh, but there's all sorts of negotiation. We're waiting for it to be assigned to a committee uh, to move it through, and you know we have to deal with you know hard lobbyists. You know? One criticism I've seen of the bill, uh, David, is that they're pushing it through without any of the benefit of the lengthy, lengthy fact-finding proceedings that the FCC had, and there's concern that if this bill is passed, even though the rules in it are a carbon copy of what the FCC had adopted, that nobody, including courts, would be bound by the interpretations that the FCC was going to use in the legislature, in their record, and how they would interpret the rule. Can you speak to that? Not, not really. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, we have a team who's been working on this on the congressional level and the state level. Um, I only work on state level stuff, and I tend to work on uh, uh, police surveillance issues, and not so much what happens in the private sector. Um, I think that probably, you know, there, there's not necessarily like as big a problem as people, you know, like to claim, and the people who are claiming it are the Comcasts, you know. So, um, I think it's probably fine. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it is it is a fairly like. Uh, you know, late in the game piece of legislation, and it is you know through a controversial gut and amend process. But the reason is that we don't want to have a a you know, we we want it to take effect as quickly as possible because we don't want that data collected because at the speed they're collecting data now, even if a year passes before we get the legislation in place, that's a lot of information on everyone. So. Oh, you got more? I can keep going. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the protections that California has passed uh, related to the government. Um, or actually, let me ask. Let me let me let me throw out a different thing too. One of the other bills that is uh, that had passed uh, back in 2002 um, was a bill called SB 1386, which was one of the the strongest data breach um, rules in the country. You know, require requesting that people if they are breached, they have to alert you that your data was lost. Um, and you can, it's, it's, it's really quite cool because you can go to various uh, government websites and you can see all the breaches that occurred and that allows you to not only know when your data has been breached but it allows you to see what the track record is for companies and it does um, uh, create an accountability measure that you might not necessarily have. Um, right now, you know, we've, got, we've got a series of bills we're working on. Um, one of the ones that we had about in 2015 was a bill called the California Electronic Communication Privacy Act, or CALECPA. So you're going to remember all these acronyms, right? Like, people are taking notes. I see your pens moving furiously. Um, CALECPA, Alphabet soup. <laughs> Alphabet soup. <laughs> Cal CALECPA was uh, designed to close the, the, the gap in what requires a warrant and what doesn't require a warrant. Um, you know, when it comes to searching your devices and searching your online accounts. Um, there had been a lot of confusion and a lot of like open discussion about whether it was required to get a warrant for, uh, for police to get your Gmail, you know, messages or to get your Facebook stuff or whether they can like look at all of the files on your phone. And we needed to clear this up because they should not be able to search everything you own without a warrant. Um, and we were able to get some of the police unions on board with this. You know, while law enforcement opposed it quite a bit, we were able to negotiate to an extent that some of them went neutral. But we were actually able to get some of the police unions on board. And the arguments that they, they found compelling was it's better to have a clear process for obtaining this information than have it something that can be thrown out later on if it goes to like the California Supreme Court. Um, but also, you know, when I was talking to police unions, we were explaining that uh, you know, police unions have a First Amendment right to associate, and you can't associate effectively if people are watching you all the time. And especially if your boss happens to control a law enforcement agency, you can search your records. Um, and they found that compelling, and we were able to get this passed. It was uh, really cool in that we had had perhaps the, one of the most uh, liberal progressive members of the California Senate, Mark Leno from San Francisco, and we had one of the most like, far right conservative members of the legislature, Joel Anderson, who's you know, historically a kind of Tea Party Republican. Both of them came together and by combining the progressive wing and the libertarian wing, uh, we were able to get the bill through, and it was actually quite amazing. Getting the tech companies involved helped, and now it's law. It's probably one of the best uh, law enforcement privacy uh, policies in the country. Um, you know, this time around we have AB 375, which is the one we just talked about, about uh, broadband privacy. Um, uh, another one that we had, which died in committee yesterday, unfortunately. I was like, all excited to tell you guys about how great this law was going to be. Uh, but unfortunately, the legislature decided to put it off for a year. Um, 
What it would have required is any time a law enforcement agency wants to acquire surveillance technology, they have to go through a, uh, a public process. For police departments, it would have meant that um, if you wanted to buy license plate readers, you wanted to buy cell phone trackers, you know, that are known as stingrays or cell site simulators, you wanted to buy drones, you wanted to buy any of these things, you would have to write a policy in advance and you would have to go to your city council and they would have to vote, yes or no. You know, like you can't just, you know, as a you know, police agency just back channel all these surveillance technologies without having uh, safeguards in place, without telling the public about it. Now they have to have public hearings, all that sort of thing. Um, it's a little different for sheriffs and district attorneys because under California law, they are um, not uh, directly under the oversight of what are the Board of Supervisors in California. And so for them, they just had to have a public meeting and they had to put out their policy. The other thing that would have been great about this law is that it would have required every two years law enforcement to issue a surveillance report about each of their technologies, saying this is the number of times we used it, this is the number of times that somebody misused it, abused it, used it inappropriately, this is how much it cost, this is how effective it was in solving crimes, you know, all sorts of information that allows people to make good decisions about, uh, you know, what is appropriate for the community when it comes to surveillance. Um, we got very, very far with this bill, um, a lot farther than I originally thought. Um, it made it out of, uh, out of the uh, California Senate, and it got almost all the way through the Assembly. It was caught up in the uh, Assembly's Appropriations Committee, which controls the purse strings of California. And uh, for whatever reason, they decided it was too expensive this year, and so we have to uh, come back um, next year and try to push a little bit harder. And so, so those are kind of some of the main things that we're working on uh, related to privacy in California uh, at the moment. Um, we're also trying to uh, leverage laws that we had passed a couple years ago regarding uh, cell site simulators that require, uh, you know, it's sort of a lesser version of the bill we wanted to pass now, which requires agencies to post their policies for these devices on their websites. Uh, there was a similar one for license plate readers where they had to post their policies for that. And we're kind of going through um, uh, naming and shaming agencies that aren't actually complying with the law, who haven't bothered to publish their policies online. A lot of agencies, you know, the, the vendors who make these surveillance technologies uh, are really, really, you know, like car salesmen sort of folks who tell them it will solve all crime, you will never have crime again if you, if you have these, uh, these technologies. And then they will um, use like a kind of, uh, you know, drug pusher method of getting police departments to take it. Like, here, your account is for free now, and then once you're hooked and you love it, then we'll start charging you for it. Um, and so we've seen them all over the place, and it's amazing. Like, I've been calling, you know, just this week police departments and saying, like, I have records showing you have, you know, an access, uh, you have access to Vigilant Solutions license plate reader database. And they're like, no, we don't. I'm like, I can send you documentation shown from, I got from other agencies showing you do. And they're like, let me go check. Oh yeah, we, we do have one. Like, well, where's your policy? Uh, we'll get back to you on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's 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 been a lot of that, and, and you know, because I it's my opinion that it's one thing to um, to pass laws, but if you're not actually going to go to the effort of enforcing them, um, then it's you might as well not pass them. So. And yet, that was always one of the concerns with the net neutrality rules: is how do you enforce this, and who's going to enforce this? And that could be an issue for California. Do they have the resources to go and track down all of these companies to see, are you actually obeying this stuff? Uh, can I open the floor to questions? If we have questions. Do you have an outline you could put up so yeah. that... Uh, could, yeah, could you do the best? Oh, we, just, we can't, I can't remember all the agencies you named. Oh, it's a box. It's a box, yes. I, I'm, I'm a visual person and I wouldn't want to torture you to rename all of these laws. Do you, don't you have an outline you could put up that name the things you just discussed in the watershed? Major so, categories of what they are. And so I'll send Scott after the, the panel like some links to the things that we've written about it, and he can put it in the um, the the conference page, the event page on the the eff .dragon, uh, .org site, and then you can. Re I, am I promising too much, Scott? No, it's okay. Just send it to me. Yeah. Okay. And the website is sort of right there on the front. Where awesome. Except you can't see it. Yeah. So I can do that. You've got your notes. Yeah, I can. I can send some stuff as well. You're welcome. I will have that for next time. I'm just one of those people who's morally opposed to PowerPoint slides because people just start reading off the page and then it's really boring.
Any other questions? Further questions? Further concerns? Yeah, oh. <laughs> so, talking about, so you, you mentioned data. Do, do they make any differences between metadata and actual, like, commonly known as data? They're supposed to. So metadata is data that's embedded in certain documents, it's embedded in websites, um, whereas the laws are trying to protect personally identifiable information, which is anything that can be specifically linked back to you. Um, there are some forms of metadata that would be personally identifiable, and those would be protected under, under the laws. Um, there, there are a few options for dealing with that. If you're uh, collecting data, you can do what's called de-identifying data, uh, you know, the medical industry has been doing this very successfully and in compliance with HIPAA for many, many years. So those structures are already in place. Uh, the trick is getting the companies to pay for that before they actually send the data out. And they don't always want to do that if there's no requirement for them to do so. Plus, it, personally identifiable information is more valuable than non-personally identifiable information. It can be used for more advertising purposes instead of just things like data mining. Um, and for instance, difference between a just website, Facebook collecting your information, it's much more useful if they can link all that specifically to you, all of your likes and who you follow and what you do, versus just another Joe Schmo website who might just be getting your name and address. The only thing they have to sell there is your is access to you for marketing, whereas Facebook can take your data and mine it and find trends based on gender and sexuality and race and age and all sorts of really actually very interesting things they do with big data. but. Um, but Anyways, to answer your question, the, the difference is all really between personally identifiable information, whether it is or is not able to be linked to you. Yeah, so, so some of the things that would qualify under California law is your first or, or last name and then combined with elements such as social security number, driver's license number, credit card or debit number, any of your passwords or usernames, medical information, uh, health insurance information, um, and auto, we got automated license with your data also added to it, so. IP address. Uh, there was another question over here. Um, I know this isn't strictly related to this topic, but um, I was wondering if either of you could speak on anything that's going on with the um, mandatory arbitration clauses and TOSs and just getting thrown into like everything now. Sure. Um, so. Federal uh, arbitration law is essentially controlled by the um, Federal Arbitration Act. It preempts any state laws that conflict with it. And some states have been trying, like California, to uh, grant more and more exceptions to mandatory arbitration clauses and contracts. Um, but with the Federal Arbitration Act, there was actually just recently a court case that said, nah, it's not going to work, California. You're preempted by the FAA. Um, it can be very difficult to get out of a mandatory arbitration clause. Um, the, where you have the best chance of getting out of it is what's called a contract of adhesion, where it is something like terms of service with AT&T, where you sign up and you don't have any negotiating power at all. It's you sign this contract or you don't get service. Um, those can be challenged. It's very expensive and very time consuming uh, because not only, even if you manage to challenge the clause, then you go to court and then you have discovery, and you're discovery hell for forever. Um, so this is why uh, what the companies have been doing, recent, uh, just until recently, a class action suit could get you around the mandatory arbitration clauses. Now companies are putting in mandatory class action waivers and mandatory um, class action arbitration waivers. Uh, so it's, it's sort of like, it's sort of similar to the tax code, where people find loopholes, and then the tax code gets bigger to shut down the loopholes. Uh, instead, in this case, it's the reverse. The government's finding what it can and can't do, and people are finding what they can and can't do, and they keep re rewriting their terms of service to end that. So I don't have really any ways, any good news for you on that front, but yes, the, they are usually, usually it's very difficult to challenge them even if they could be challenged. Does, any pub does anybody publish a, sort of a, a cautionary watch list alert for people like me who just um, say, yes, I agree with whatever app I happen to need at the time and I don't have time to read all that stuff? And, and then another thing, just to, don't let us leave without telling us what keeps you up at night, what really, really concerns you that might interest us, and um, how do I get off the telemarketer list for hits on my 
Right, let's take those questions in reverse. Uh, what gets you off the telemarketer list is signing up for the do not call list. Um, even with a mobile telephone, if you put it on the do not call list, they're supposed to not call you. Um, there are, of course, 10 million exceptions to it, the biggest one being political campaigns, because, of course, politicians aren't going to include themselves in do not call registries. Where do you find the list? You um, Google do not call list, and it's a federal website. Yeah, the, the, yeah government officials don't necessarily, politicians don't necessarily like pay a lot of attention to these things. I think one of my favorite things is that there's you know, laws forbidding uh, robocalls that don't start off with a human being involved. Oh. And you know, that's you know, technically the law in California, and yet I get you know, election cycle, plenty of Governor Jerry Brown robocalls that are not started by a human being, and you know, if the person at the top is ignoring it, then that kind of gives like room for everybody else to ignore it. Um, as far as uh, uh, the terms of service stuff, I know there are people out there, the, um, the entity that I, I usually go to for these things is called the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse in, um, in San Diego, and they do reviews of, of terms of service, they do probably the most comp comprehensive consumer privacy guidelines, they uh, also have a pretty amazing data breach watch. Um, I, I'd have to look up some of the other people who do terms of service things, but there's so many out there now at this point that um, it's hard to do it. We'll do it occasionally. One of my favorite little projects with terms of service was in discovering that lots of news sites had in their terms of service saying that if you were under the age of 17, you were not allowed to visit their website, <laughs> including <laughs> Seventeen Magazine. <laughs> um, and that was quite fun to put it out there. And, you know. Uh, you know, us publishing a couple of blog posts on it got, you know, scores of these changed just because it was so ridiculous. That that's that's a, usually an overreaction to the federal COPPA yeah. law, actually. Yeah. So. But it's it just, yeah, it's, but it's really quite silly. And, and, Lawyers but, I mean, run them up. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, COPPA, you're a little bit safer if you go for age 13 and below. Um, and there's no real reason to do 17 and below. But I mean, for like news sites, like, like you're gonna say that kids in America shouldn't be able to like read the news? No, that's that's silly. Um, and then the that was final called privacy rights clearing yeah. out of San Francisco. Yeah, and they have they have like um, hotlines you can call if you have questions too. They're um, they're fantastic. They are um, they're you know uh, EFF tends to be like have like a much broader audience, and we try to do things in a lot you know very. Um, uh, you know, very populist kind of way, but privacy real rights clearinghouse are like the wonks on this stuff. They are like who I go to when I have when I have questions. And as for your other question, I'm going to give two quick answers uh, from one from either side. As a consumer, what keeps me up at night is if we don't get the net neutrality rules restored, is that the internet will turn into cable TV, where you have to have tiers of paid content in order to gain access. Plus then you'll have, not only will you be paying for access to the content, you'll be paying for different tiers of speed as well, much more than we are already. Um, as a lawyer, what keeps me up at night is my clients um, not, is my clients putting up a privacy policy that is inaccurate. Because not only can you run into trouble with California if you put up an inaccurate privacy policy, that opens you up to um, fraud lawsuits, uh, just general, uh, lawsuits for fraud and misrepresentation and civil court, and that can happen any court, anywhere, any time that you are reaching a client, uh, because choice of law clauses and choice of venue clauses, like the mandatory arbitration clauses, are not always enforceable in these sorts of contracts, so. What keeps me awake at night? Um, lots of things. Um, one of the things that, that worries me the most is license plate readers. Uh, are folks familiar with these? Can I give a quick one, two, three on it? Well, I'll give the one, two, three anyway. So license plate readers are high-speed cameras that capture photos of cars that pass and then uh, do optical character recognition to grab the plate numbers. They add the time, date, location to that information and then upload it to a database. Um, there are two ways that there are two general ways that police use this. Uh, they will put um, cameras in stationary positions, like on street lights or on uh, you know just by the side of the road, and they'll collect everybody passing by. The other thing that happens is that uh, they will attach uh, their cameras to patrol cars, and they'll just drive around capturing everybody they pass. Uh, what's a little more nefarious is that there are companies that do this 
you know, like on a, in, a, in a private capacity, and are essentially data scraping your whereabouts by just having uh, repo guys or you know uh, any any kind of just contractors just drive around the city all the time, and then they will take that data and they will sell it to debt collectors. Uh, they will sell it to banks. Uh, they will sell it to insurance companies. Like if you you know go to insurance company, so the insurance company can check everywhere that you've been and what your driving patterns are before quoting you a rate or before giving you a loan, um, which I find really, really gross, especially since um, unlike other things where you have means of protecting your privacy, you you know, at least in California, you cannot, you are forbidden by law for doing anything to your license plate that would interfere with the license plate reader. And that is ostensibly to allow the police to do things, but it also opens you up to like these predatory companies that are collecting your data all the time. What really keeps me awake is, <laughs> is when facial recognition becomes the same thing. Right now, facial recognition, it's, it's, kind of coming along like it's it can be useful but it's mostly used right now for identification purposes for we have uh, a suspect we're going to run their picture against the mugshot database um, what happens when the technology is so good that they have no problem uh, doing live uh, recognition of your face and instead of doing optical character recognition and putting in a database they do metadata analysis of your face and put that in a system and so not only are they tracking you where you go in your car but they can track everywhere that you're walking around on the street and that that really scares me I think that um, one of the things that uh, was interesting in terms of legislatures is Chicago, as Illinois is that Illinois recently passed uh, the California Biometric Information Privacy Act I think that's I think that's what CalBIPA stands for. I, I think of these things as acronyms. CalBIPA, that's another one. Uh, no, sorry, not CalBIPA. It is, that's the one we want to pass. Um, it's, uh, See, Illinois, we get them mixed up. Il it's it's <laughs> 10 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, it's the Illinois BIPA law, but that requires uh, at least companies to um, get your permission before they capture your biometric information. Um, you know, so like, you know, apps and, and Facebook and that sort of thing. And it know, is the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. So, IBIPA? Yep. IBIPA. Um, but, you know, in a similar way, you know, Illinois is a fairly big state, and so Illinois doing it is going to influence other states, but it's also going to make um, uh, app manufacturers and websites have to make this decision are we going to geofence off Illinois and have an entire infrastructure that we have to build for one state, or are we just going to build it and, and deploy it in a, in a wider scale? But yes, facial recognition that is not necessarily used to only identify you, but to track where you go. That's what worries me. Next question. Um, actually, maybe. Maybe. Uh, speaking to her question, there's also a site, I believe it's TOSDR, like TLDR, but it's TOSDR. Uh, that takes terms of service and puts them into very understandable language and rates them. So that's a good site to look at. T-O-S-D-R dot org. There you go. Um, but my question is, early in the presentation you were saying California is, is pretty good about protecting your privacy when it comes to private entities, but maybe not as good when it comes to the government itself. Did you mean anything beyond like the stinger and license plate questions, or are there other examples? Oh, so so I, I should have mentioned these earlier. You just reminded me. I'm uh, still catching up. I'm slow this morning. So we've got several pieces of legislation that were were introduced in response to the Trump administration, and it started off as one bill, uh, SB 54. You may have seen in the news. It's often referred to as the Sanctuary State Bill, um, in which they packed a lot of of. Uh, of privacy measures to a single bill, and they, they kind of fell into three categories. One was to ensure that data collected by the government um, is not handed over to ICE for immigration enforcement purposes. And I think the general theory behind it, beyond just you know the the uh, you know the you know pro immigrants rights things, is that you know we can't protect people's privacy unless we protect everyone's privacy, and that includes it, it doesn't matter what kind of resident you are like. Protecting one person is protecting everybody's. Uh, the second was to ensure that data collected by the government is not used to create religious registries. And this was at a time where the Muslim registry was something that was always in the news and there was always being described by the, uh, the president as something he wanted to do without any details. And so they wrote this. And then the third, which was perhaps 
to us, the, the, the most important element is that it, required, it would have required every state agency to only collect the bare minimum that they need to provide services. They cannot just add a bunch of fields that they don't actually need so they have it on hand. I mean, certainly they can you know, maybe make it optional. I think that was left open. Uh, but they, don't, they, they can't collect things they don't need. And they had to review all of their policies to come up with better uh, purging and retention rules and get rid of data that they don't actually need. Um, what ended up happening is because it was such a large bill and it was such a controversial bill that they split it into three. So um, SB 54 became the sanctuary state bill on its own. Uh, there's been a lot of negotiation about that privacy element. Uh, the bill also has lots of other things about you know when ICE can get data or when ICE can you know go into a jail and interview people and you know can ICE you know what extent ICE can work with law enforcement. But there was this still this element about what uh, about the data. Um, there were some amendments that were introduced very recently that we need to take a look at before I can tell you exactly how that's impacted that element. Um, the Muslim registry or the religious registry bill is still strong, still going. And then the, uh, the government privacy element has become its own bill, uh, uh, to, I think it's AB 244, and that, um, and that or I think it's uh, SB 244. And that one has is a lot more complicated now. It, you know, where it was a paragraph before, it's now like a huge bill, um, and so I, I'm not able to retain all the measures in my head at the moment. Uh, but if you're interested, I can I can show you the legislation afterwards. We can put it in the uh, in the notes. Next question. Um, I, this is okay. I have a question about the. Um, I work in education law, and FERPA is a big deal for me. Uh, from the last I heard, and this was about maybe six months ago, California was doing some really interesting things around metadata for um, educational scores and things of that nature. I was wondering if there was an update on that. So the state was collecting metadata for educational data, but ran into some problems with FERPA, and I don't know what became of it. I was wondering if you did. Well, so next year at Dragon Con, I'm going to make Scott send, have you all send your questions in two weeks in advance so I can prepare. <laughs> uh, so just, just put that in your schedule now. Um, I can't necessarily talk to that to, to a huge extent. I know that, that there's been some movement to take a look at it because there was a, uh, a, a legal case in which um, some uh, education advocates had uh, been able to get access to loads of, of student records for them to do research analysis and that created all kinds of um, alarm for families. Um, you know, and, and parents across the state, and so now they have to look at um, what you know, what kind of information should be released and what shouldn't, and is is uh, uh, anonymization, or you know, is that actually effective? To what extent can you de-anonymize something if they're going to say, oh, we're just going to remove people's names, but then somebody who, who's intrepid can just you know, piece together what's out there and start putting names back in. Um, that, that's about all I can tell you about where things are. We do have a student privacy team who can probably give you a lot more. Our focus has generally been on the federal level or on the consumer level. We did file a complaint with the FTC against Google for the, um, the technology they've been giving out to schools and that not being consistent with the rules for student privacy. So, you know, that's something we've worked. That's where a lot of our focus has been. I'll get back to you in two weeks. <laughs> Next question. So talking about the facial recognition, there's been a lot of news about that possibly being on our phones and, and other devices. Um, and from a manufacturing standpoint, it's not likely you're going to produce certain like devices only for California and the rest for everywhere else. And specifically, how is that going to kind of, what do you think the reach is on that with Apple being headquartered in California? Uh, you can go to I mean, I was going to say, from a from a device standpoint, manufacturing, it would have to be a software fix, because, like you said, they're not going to manufacture devices specifically for California, um, or even if it's not a software fix, just an internal practices issue, because there's only so much you can do realistically. We can legislate everything until it bleeds, but that doesn't mean it's practical to enforce it, and so that's the balance that the law has to take between actually writing the best possible law and complying with the reality of the market and technology. Yeah. And, and often the, um, the process for, for how legislation gets done, it's not always this case, is that you might start off with a piece of legislation that, um, that begins with transparency. So requiring a privacy policy, requiring terms of service, requiring disclosure of this sort of thing with license plate readers. Like, even if you're not a law enforcement agency, you still have to have a policy online. 
Um, so you may start with that, and then when that starts revealing some of the practices and the problems out there, it's then easier to go back to the legislature and have like, this is like, it's not theoretical, here is the issues, and then maybe you can get another one through. But you know, I, I, at the same time, a lot of places will just go straight to like, let's regulate it, and oftentimes that'll be very media-based. Um, but you know, like uh, having all these companies headquartered in California does have a huge impact on them. The flip side is is that we have to go up against them in the legislature, and um, a lot of these companies all are also big campaign donors, and they also employ lots of lobbyists. Um, but also, the hard thing is that they're all seen as job creators. They're all seen as driving the the uh, the you know innovation economy in California. So if they say, uh, you know, this is going to kill jobs, or this is not going to help us grow jobs, or this is going to impact us, that holds a lot of weight um, uh, with politicians for whom job creation is like a top priority. And you see this not only in the California level, but on the federal level as well. Um, Apple finally took a position, it's the first time they've taken a position in the net neutrality fight, they've been neutral, so to speak. Um, but they came out yesterday and said, we're in favor of net neutrality, do not allow fast lanes on the internet. Um, part of the spillover effect from that was a number of other companies like Facebook and Google and tech, uh, content providers who had been called to or asked to come to Congress and testify before the Senate have pulled out uh, because they see this as um, this investigation by, the, by Congress saying, oh, we should have a universal rule applying to everybody on the internet. Um, it sounds good in theory, but it doesn't really work in practice because the needs for business-to-business -business interaction are very different from business-to-consumer, which is what the net neutrality rules were uh, focused on. And so they're basically saying this is political theater and we're not going to participate. But because they seem more emboldened to do that because Apple finally took a stance. I'm not sure that fully answers your question, but, uh, but that's what we got. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I think in that case, um, Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming out at 10 a.m. on a Saturday.